in this episode, I get on the ferry to cross the Cook Strait and start exploring one of the South Island's more well-known tracks. Well, as expected, pitch black. Morning. Got the packing done up pretty quick. It's still pitch black. It's going to be a cool one riding there. It's about seven degrees, but I've been building up a bit of sweat packing up so as I've been rushing. I should have plenty of time, but I'll get on with it and see if we can get through these gates. There were two signs. One said the gate opened at 6 a.m., the other 8 a.m. I was about to find out which was correct. The first gate was still locked, so not feeling me with a lot of confidence that the others have been open over the little stream crossing along the tree line road and then yes, the gate has been opened. So, no riding through the bush to try and get out to get to the ferry on time. can be a little tricky working out which roads to take when you're heading into places like ferry terminals. Well, well that makes things a lot easier. Just follow the right colour line. In this case, the pink one. Someone was definitely thinking when they put this in. Riding into these big ferries is like being swallowed up by a whale. Not that I've ever been swallowed up by a whale. Each ferry I go on seems to do things a little different. This one has a bracket for your front wheel to slot into. I strap my bike down. Hopefully it wouldn't go anywhere. Made it onto the boat, so one step closer to the South Island. It's quite calm in here, but we'll see what it's like once we get out into that strait. It's gonna be rough or not. It's funny, in Australia, Nanny State, there's a roof everything. So you don't, you actually have to leave your bike and the staff of a boat tied down, whereas here, or deck hands, what they be called. Here, you just do it yourself. So hopefully, I tied it down tight enough. Not the cleanest window I'd ever looked through, but the boat started shuddering out of the dock. It then made its way across the Cook Strait, which is 93 kilometres, or if you like, 58 miles. I made my way off the boat, and as luck would have it, it was into the sunshine. Through the port, and into the town of Picton. There are two very windy roads to the east and west of Picton, but the main road heads south, and that's the one I was taking. I soon started passing a lot of vineyards, and I mean a lot, for almost 60 kilometers, as this is the Marlborough wine region. Now that is a lot of wine in those storage tanks. I was heading to the small town of St. Anneau, 127 kilometres from Picton, and on the banks of Lake Rotowiti to fill up with fuel and get a few supplies. Now they are the poles that go at the end of each row of vines, which means someone has a lot of work ahead of them, putting them in the ground for what must be a new vineyard. I'm glad I'm not the one digging the holes. finally made it past all the vineyards. I think I may be heading into that valley there, after stopping in the town of St. Arno. This is the turn I'll be taking to get there. A 
quick fill up, then I thought, while I'm here, I may as well check out Lake Rogue Now, that's a lot of cars coming from the lake. Oh wow. It seems to be a speedboat event. It didn't look like I was going to be able to get to the water, so I continued on. I headed back down the road I'd come in on for a few kilometres to the turnoff. There are two well-known tracks in the northeast of the South Island. If you are coming from the north, they both end at Hamner Springs. The Molesworth track, but unfortunately, due to it being so dry, was closed. The other track was Rainbow Road, which I was going to take running from St Anu to Hamner Springs. It is 114 kilometres in length and goes through Rainbow Station, which is a private property, but allows access through the station for a fee. The fee is to maintain the road. I was about to see this sign a lot more. A ford is a shallow place in a river or stream, allowing one to walk or drive across. So it basically looks like this, but normally with water. finally reached the dirt and the track seemed in pretty good condition in this first section. So my question is, when does a ford become a river crossing? Is it the width you have to cross or the depth of water? If anyone has an answer, I'd love to know. This section of the Rainbow Road was basically a tunnel of trees. You always feel like you're going faster than you actually are when passing objects so close. Track dropped down. I seem to be getting closer to the main river with these small streams feeding into it. I rode into an open field and, well, I saw my first opportunity for a photo. So I pulled over to grab a shot. This is Wairu River, which is what's carved out this stunning valley. Wairu means many waters. It is one of the longest rivers in New Zealand's South Island. It flows for 170 kilometres from the Spencer Mountains, firstly in a northward direction and then northeast down into the long straight valley in the Marlborough region, which now makes sense why there are so many wineries there, as it would provide a lot of fertile land for the wineries. nice to be able to get onto a dirt track within about an hour and a half of the ferry. Got some fuel just in case. I don't think this track is actually that long, probably under 100 kilometres. It's, it's got a few potholes, so just in the dark you've got to watch out for those. But otherwise it's pretty good, it's pretty easy. There's a bit of loose rock, but nothing too hard. A couple of little, as they call them, Ford's crossings. Ford crossings. Someone will correct me on that. But yeah, I want to try and get close to the water so I can see how cold it is. There is a camp spot along here apparently, so we'll see if I come across that. I might, might camp there for the night, we'll see. I think I'm just under halfway through and the water is crystal clear. I bet it's freezing cold as well, but it is gorgeous, so clear. Bet all my fishermen mates are looking at that, just going, where's your line? Oh well. We'll keep moving on. I 
finally made it to the entry into the Rainbow Station. There is an old guy that collects the $30 fee, which you can only pay in cash. The station is 6,468 hectares. Located in the upper Wairu Valley, the property is confined to the valley floor and extends over 60 kilometres from end to end. I come to my first gate, and with all gates on farms and stations, you leave them how you find them. finally cross the Wairu River. Well, there's an interesting name for a section of track. by the river crossing, I think I'd actually made it to the campsite. Now I feel like I'm enjoying myself. My boots are wet. Always a good sign when you're on a bike ride. I mean that is if you're not all wet, just your boots. Then it's fun. All wet, not so good. So this is one of the three camp spots that are marked. It's just grass next to a river, but it will do me fine. There are some rocks in the grass, so I'll see how I go with my pegs. I might wander up the uh, little river here. It's got a little cascading happening, so we'll see what's up there. But I guess I should set up tent. It's the sun's quite high, so I don't think it's that late. So I'm liking this compared to Australia. <laughs> I don't have to spend all day to get somewhere. I'll set up tent, and then we'll go a little bit of exploring. I pulled my gear off the bike. Wait, tent. I thought I should probably dry out that cover first. Might make it a bit more comfortable if there's sun out, so I could do that. But first, the tent. I walked a little way up the stream to check it out. You probably can't hear me because of the rushing water, but what a cool little rapid. Would it be a rapid? Is it big enough? I then wandered downstream along the river until I came across a guy I fly fishing. I saw a guy fly fishing, so I thought I'd say hi. His name's Richard and he's from the south of the island, just cruising through like me. It looks like good fishing, but he says he got here a little late for um, just the sun's gone off and the bugs have gone, so. Ah well. Come up to the top, actually. The water was so clear, you could easily see the fish. What's he feeding? 
luckily it's not me fishing. But we definitely wouldn't catch anything. There is one in there, but it's not biting what he's offering. So is it just a guess on the fly? Or? Absolutely, because I have no idea. I doubt that the guts. Yeah, I'm from down south, Gore, down the bottom. They generally take the same sort of stuff, but it depends how much you've been fished, I suppose. Yeah. There was a brown trout on the far side, which was over 40 centimetres long, which seemed kind of big to me. Oh, he's turned. Well, he looked at it. He did. Just put it in front of him and see what it... He's moving. Well, he's taking interest. He's just doing enough to get my hopes up. <laughs> Battle of the Mines. We found another one and he's he's having a crack. He's looking. The fish that is at the lure. Is a lure when it's white? Will the New Zealander win? Or will the brown trout win? Get right behind them. Bro. But in the end, all the fish stayed in the river for another day. It was cool to have a wander and bump into a fly fisherman, Richard. My pants have dried a little, so that's a good thing. I'm liking the uh, more relaxed approach here with the shorter distances in New Zealand. Just cruise a bit more. I spent the rest of the late afternoon just chilling out. Not a bad way to end the day. When we wake, hear the birds and see the sun. Side by side our fears are done. All the good times just begun. In the next episode, I continue up the rainbow track with more river crossings, spectacular valleys and encountering some weather. Then I head towards the east coast. Oh, we know what we have, let's hold on tight Found what we're looking for in life